So, our next speaker comes to us from the UK, Professor Andrew Holden from the University of Bedfordshire. Uh, he's the Professor of Environmental and Tourism and the recent Director of the Institute of Tourism Research. So, give a warm welcome to Mr. Andrew Holden. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the invitation to the to the seminar and to be able to talk about um, responsible aviation and um, look at it um, in the in the future about how we achieve um, <coughs> responsible um, aviation. What I wanted to say was really to provide a wider context of what kind of future is aviation likely to fit into in terms of looking at the environmental changes and our responses to them as a, as a society and to, to think about what we actually want aviation to achieve um, in society. Um, I mean, the fact that we're having this debate today um, is, is, you know, is, is very significant. If you've gone back 20 years, um, it would be very unlikely that we'd be having a debate about responsible aviation. And my, my own background is that I studied environmental sciences as an undergraduate, um, or a, a, a young person as an undergraduate in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, I completed a doctorate in geography um, I work for a company called the Economic Studies Group um, in, in London. I've moved into academia. And, you know, I've seen a tremendous shift over those decades in terms of the way we look at, um, we, way we look at aviation, the way we look at tourism, and the way we look at the relationship to the environment. And a lot of the debates that we have today are very, very reflective of those changes. So I'm trying to think today about you know, what are the changes that are taking place? What are they going to be in the future? And how is responsible aviation going to, to fit, into, fit into that picture? So if I begin by just trying to imagine a future where by 2025, 2030, we've completely stopped the uh, selling of uh, these uh, carbon-driven cars. Uh, we've moved to electric cars. Um, and that, in turn, has developed a tremendous demand for electricity, clean electricity, renewable electricity, a quadrupling of demand by 2050. So there's a need to meet that demand for recyclable uh, power. Our homes are no longer heated by carbon. That's, that's something that is in the past. It's history. Um, we've now we've got electrified heating completely from renewable sources, possibly hydrogen. Um, heating. Um, our lifestyles have begun to change in terms of what we eat, so we move from um, having a meat-based diet to at least a 20% reduction in meat eating towards um, vegetarian um, diets. Um, agricultural land has been changed, it's been removed, so it's now been uh, replaced 15% of it for the growth of forests, uh, for carbon capture, and for the production of uh, renewable energy sources, which can be used, as we've already heard, possibly in aviation um, in, in the future in a commercially viable um, way. The North Sea oil fields that we've used to extract carbon are now being primarily used for carbon capture. So we're now pumping carbon dioxide into those, um, uh, into the strata, so we can, uh, replacing the oil that was there, with carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. And I've got some examples of Norway, Rotterdam, Antwerp, and Ghent, where Norway is already doing that, and Rotterdam, Antwerp, and Ghent have been identified as key sites, key ports for the future for the um, capture of uh, carbon emissions um, and storing them um, in, the, in the North Sea. And a future where the, there may be only a possible limited expansion of aviation, 
and that would be dependent on continued reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, per passenger per kilometer, and also the development of electric planes that we've just been hearing about uh, for short haul travel. Now, that future is one that was actually put out in the United Kingdom last week. This is not something that is fiction. This has actually come from the United Kingdom's Commission on Climate Change. So if I take the United Kingdom as an example of a developed country that is moving towards zero carbon emissions by 2050 or earlier, becoming a carbon neutral country. This is pretty much reflective, I would say, of the policy that aviation is likely to be fitting into in the, in the future. So I've asked, are we, are we passing a threshold? And this commission is significant because it actually advises government very strongly about what it should be doing in terms of moving towards a carbon neutral future. So there's widespread political support within the United Kingdom um, for, this, for this kind of future. And obviously, if you look at some of the other aspects I've got on here, um, things that we are in a changing uh, kind of environment in terms of how we look at um, our relationship to nature. So as Greta Thunberg um, has been very active in promoting aspects of climate change. Uh, we've had Extinction Rebellion protests in, in, in London very, very recently. Uh, widespread school days of action, uh, school days, school children days of action over climate change. Um, declaration of a climate change emergency in the United Kingdom Parliament, the Green New Deal of the United uh, US De USA Democrats, and the UN Global Assessment Report about um, global ecosystems that came out last week as well. And what I'm saying here is that we've heard many of these things before. There's been protests about climate change, there's been worry about it, but I think we are at a very much a threshold in society where we are looking at things very, very differently in terms of how we, how we actually go into the future. And there is a wider acceptance of environmental limits having an impact on our lifestyles. And aviation is going to, and is, not going to, is, as we've heard this morning, already adjusting to those environmental limits. And I think the big debate about responsible aviation is how we actually, well, the facts that we accept in terms of what aviation's impact is on the environment. So if we take climate change as um, one example, the GHG emissions presently um, are roughly about 2%, as we heard this morning, of the world total GHG emissions that are coming from other, other sources. There are other figures that you can see out there that will increase that to 6 7% when you look in radiative forcing or emissions at high level and other aspects of vapor trails, etc. So there is scientific disagreement over that, over that figure. There's also the tremendous growth in aviation, the aviation market, um, you know, which was estimated to approximately double by 2035. So great opportunities for aviation, great opportunities to help fulfill many of the requirements that society has for economic growth, for job creation. Um, we heard this morning about you know, aviation's tremendous role in actually helping to uh, fulfill the sustainable development goals, for example. It has a role in poverty uh, reduction. Obviously, if you take tourists to other countries, to less developing countries, um, there is an impact on the economy, and you can channel that into things like pro-poor tourism, et cetera. So there's a, there's a real, real opportunity to use aviation in a way that is not only good for business, but is also very good for policy and for society. Yet, there is also the need to operate this within um, envir environmental limits. And <coughs> what the, um, you know, looking at a framework for responsible aviation, what came out of the United Nations Global Assessment Report that came out last week was that they talked about the need for a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. And whilst that may sound very technical, what I'm trying to say is that 
there is perhaps a need to reflect much more closely on what is responsible aviation within that kind of framework where we're looking, yes, at the technological advancement, which is fantastic both in terms of um, electric aviation, in terms of en tremendous technolog technological advancement in engines, uh, reduction of emissions, um, ways of um, reducing weight on aircraft, all the things we've heard about this morning, which have brought down the emissions per aircraft substantially. The problem is, or the challenge is, that it's a tremendous growth market. You know, that the, the pace of demand um, is so, so high that it's very difficult for the technology to actually keep up with um, the, uh, the growth in demand in terms of reducing the overall GHG emissions. So then you begin to look at, you know, carbon capture, carbon offsetting. So the Accommodating aviation's global significance within environmental limits will be, as we've heard, a big challenge for the, for the industry into the future. And um, that is aspects, again, what we heard this morning about stakeholder responsibility. So that includes governments, private sector, us as consumers, um, you know, across the different range of stakeholders involved in aviation. Um, as I said, a reflection on the use of aviation. Do we just take it as a complete norm and not think about it? Do we just treat it as a business activity? Or do we reflect more closely upon the, re the interaction of economic growth, the use for hedonism, for pleasure, um, and uh, societal, pol societal policies like Millennium Development Goals and poverty reduction? The technological and scientific advances we've heard about, but also the Another important aspect of this is the market change. You know, are we, are we at a point where sometime we're going to see fairly soon that there is a much wider questioning of the use of aviation or how we use it, to be more accurately? I mean, aviation is a fantastic part of our lifestyle. I mean, no one, I don't think many people would, would dispute that in terms of the benefits it can bring us. It, it links us, as we've heard, to other people, to other cultures. It allows us to explore the world. It brings economic advancement. It's, it is there and it is going to stay there. And it is going to grow. But the question, real questions are how do we, how do we actually grow that in a, in a responsible way that um, is, um, is, is possible for society? For example, if we take the use of biofuels and we take the example of the United Kingdom where you're changing 15% of agricultural land for carbon capture and biofuel production. There are implications of that. And one obvious implication is that if you take agricultural land out of production, there is likely to be um, a rise in, in prices of, of food products. I mean, that is a, you know, a real possible if you, possibility uh, outcome of um, changing more land over to biofuel production. There's other cases in other countries. There's a case in Uganda um, where um, biofuel production was wanted uh, to, uh, to grow sugarcane um, for ethanol, which could be used for cars. Um, but this was at the cost of removal of the tropical rainforest to actually convert the land over to agricultural land. So there are knock-on costs and implications of what we actually do um, in terms of how we provide solutions to particular aspects of lifestyle and things we choose to to be involved in. So there is a more holistic aspect um, to this. So could, mark, could ethical concerns, for example, over the welfare of future generations and the environment more generally about climate change possibly influence the way we travel? Um, and this is a question that um, we, we could be, be asking ourselves. So putting it into practice, what would a more responsible aviation actually look like? Um, to what extent is this going to be voluntary, i.e. driven by the industry, driven by the market, or is it going to involve elements of more coercion through government policy and government decision making? And as we've heard this morning, one thing about aviation is a global, it's a global industry. And this can't be done in isolation. It's no point in that one government uh, taxing um, aviation fuel if, if, if planes can refill 
in other countries free of charge, and that's what they choose to do, and that actually produces an overall increase in GHG emissions. So, you know, this, it's, a, it's a complex kind of question, but if we took something like voluntary carbon offsetting, which we've heard about this morning, one study showed that only 50% of the world's airlines, major world's airlines, actually offer uh, voluntary carbon offsetting when you buy a ticket. And another aspect of this is, what is the uptake on that? You know, how many passengers actually do take the voluntary carbon offsetting route? One study that I've seen, that uptake is 1% of passengers. But we, what, we, what we are operating in, in, to a certain extent, is a void of information, you know, about what the uptakes are. Um, and we're operating also in scientific conflict of contributions of aviation to GHG uh, emissions. So that this is a big, you know, this is a big debate about the information that we have to make decisions upon. One policy that's been put forward is the idea of frequent flyer taxation. So if it's accepted that we do want to reduce the number of flights that are being taken, if, we, if, we do, if that becomes part of policy, if you fly once per year, you pay no extra taxation. If you fly four times, then you pay, say, 10% of your ticket price in a tax. It's, it's, a, it's an incremental taxation system. Flight advertisements to carry CO2 uh, emission warnings, that's another um, aspect, um, to raise awareness um, of consumers about the impacts of their flights in terms of their contribution to GHG um, emissions. So, you know, this is a kind of thing that's really challenging because, I mean, we all, I, I mean, I haven't met anyone who doesn't like flying. I think we all enjoy flying. You know, everyone enjoys it. I mean, you know, it's... Um, is something that, as I said, that opens up a whole new world to us and is exciting. And um, but does it actually justify the environmental costs always? And how do we actually use uh, flying in a more sustainable uh, way? Other aspects have been put forward by governments generally in terms of GHG emissions, um, or sorry, not by governments, by non-governmental organisations, is the idea of individual carbon um, allowances per year. So we would have um, a carbon allowance individually. And if we went about that, a bit like we have the European uh, Union uh, trade emission uh, scheme for, for, for trading for industry, we would then have to buy carbon credits. So we wanted to exceed that, which would then be used for offsetting the carbon emissions that we, that we use. Um, Technological and scientific developments, we've heard tremendous advances in that in the case of aviation, electric planes, and there's also moved to things like even geoengineering on a big macro scale, so refreezing of the Earth's poles is something that is being put forward as a way of combating climate change. Change of lifestyles from eating to flying, the environmentally responsible citizen, um, what extent would that influence um, aviation? And if we look at something like casual flying, it's been, been uh, called, um, it's estimated that 60% of budget air travel or low-cost air travel um, is induced, i.e. there's no reason for taking it other than it being cheap. Um, it's, very, it's very inexpensive to travel, so people, people will do it. So these are some of the, the issues that I think you know, come into the context of thinking about responsible, um, responsible aviation. And I just wanted to, to leave you with this, um, with this slide, which you, um, I don't know if you can, how well you can see that, but this is the idea of um, carrying a climate change warning on aviation advertising. So the, um, the advertisement at the top, what it says underneath in the small letters is your return flight from London to San Diego contributes to climate change um, as much as heating your home for one and a half years. This is an example, you know. Uh, I'm sure there will be people who will dispute that scientific fact. But this is an example of raising environmental awareness about what we are doing when we are flying. Whether we choose to believe the fact is up to us. Whether we choose to change our behavior is up to us. 
But I think the knowledge and awareness is something that we have probably a right to know about in terms of what are what is the impact of us making that decision. And we did hear that this morning, you know, that we should make more informed decisions as consumers about how we use aviation. But to do that, we need to have information. We need to be aware of um, what we are actually doing. And the one at the bottom um, says, underneath your return flight from London to Malaga contributes to climate change as much as nine and a half years average uh, t TV viewing. So there's these issues um, that come up about the, the resource implications of, of aviation and thinking how we use it um, in a responsible way um, into the future. Because it's something that we all enjoy. It's something that brings tremendous economic benefits um, to society. Um, it's something that can spread global wealth, reduce inequalities between countries. It's definitely got an opportunity to do that between developed and less developed countries. Um, it's a tremendous way of linking people um, from different cultures and enhancing cultural understanding. But it has to operate within environmental limits. It can't just be completely ignorant or um, operating in a void of um, the envirom wider environmental context. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Holden. Uh, I think we ha still have time for one or two questions, if anyone has any. Okay. Where's the microphone? Uh, here's one question here. Over here. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. I'm Lena from a P2P Travel Magazine, and I um, just wonder, is there any kind of uh, statistics on how much or how many percentage of people who are flying are actually paying compensation on the flights? Well, um, yeah, the, the, the only statistic I've seen is 1%. So that's the Yeah, yeah, it's 1% of actually. It's approximately 50% of airlines, the boards, big airlines, offer carbon offsetting and the uptake. The only figure I've seen is 1%. I mean, other people may have seen other figures, but that's the one I, I've seen. Yeah, I think I heard you right, but yeah. I didn't believe yeah. you. But <laughs> <that's the case. laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if, it, I mean, what do you, do you it's think about, right. about 1%? It's right. yeah. uh, but I also think that it's really important that, um, that we talk about carbon offsetting in all its different forms, because as you said, people need to have the information to be able to make educated mm. decisions. Mm. And um, one of the targets when we launched the push for change uh, carbon offsetting uh, service to our customers was to sort of start normalizing the discussion about carbon offsetting. So I think it makes sense that you look at what are the emissions of your flight, you compare different routes, and then you make your choices and hopefully you choose to offset. Um, Finnair, for example, uh, we offset all the duty travel of our office staff. So when I fly, when I flew to London, mm -hmm. Uh, last week with our CEO, that air travel was then offset mm. by my employer using the same um, service that we have, mm. have for our customers. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you, if I may <laughs> use the, a little bit Please of time, do. about sustainable aviation fuels. So it cannot com compete with food production. Um, it shouldn't really destroy uh, the carbon sinks that we have. So what's your view on the sort of raw materials or sources, what are the more most sustainable alternatives for biofuels, for aviation? Specifically for biofuels? Mm. Um, I mean, that is a very technical, technical question. And um, in terms of specifically biofuels for aviation, the most, the best type, I don't think I can really give that te technical answer, to be honest. I think that's too... So tiny. it is. It is a yeah. tricky question. It's a very tricky <laughs> question, and I think the. If you just want to, this one okay, might yeah. work better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think the um, for short haul. I mean, I, I definitely do 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 think in electric aviation is really the way forward. I mean, I really I really believe that it's got tremendous potential, as you as you were talking about, and um, you know I think that. But for the use of biofuels, I mean, which one is best? I don't know, right? You know, really, that is a really technical kind of question. I mean, certainly, I would say that 
um, like you, you quite rightly point out, that uh, anything that reduces the potential uh, of a carbon sink or um, involves um, reduction in food production, I mean, you've got to look at those as the two key variables for saying which ones don't we use, uh, alongside how efficient they are in terms of the aircraft. Um, yeah. I'm sure we will discuss this in much further detail in the panel discussion because carbon offsetting is one of the topics that really interests people and there's much, uh, many misconceptions about it so we will discuss it later. But thank you Professor Holden, uh, let's give a <laughs> warm applause for him again and